A truth witnessed in many a programming class and reflected in many a stock photo is that computers store all information using only zeros and ones. Upon hearing this information, you might have questions like how or possibly even why, which is exactly what this video will answer. Along the way, we'll learn about abstraction, which in my opinion is the most fundamental concept in all of computer science. First, let's look at bits. Bits are tiny objects in a computer that can each be in one of two states. By convention, we call these states one and zero, but these names are kind of arbitrary and you might see alternatives like high and low or on and off. We could also come up with our own names like yes and no. This way we can use bits to store the answers to yes and no questions. For example, consider the game Guess Who? in which players must interrogate each other with yes or no questions to figure out which of a cast of characters their opponent holds. A typical set of questions might look like this. Given enough clues, you can eventually piece together what the character looks like. Consider then that this string of ones and zeros, along with the questions that were asked to get them, uniquely identify this character. Someone equipped with these questions could, by only looking at the sequence of ones and zeros, reconstruct the corresponding person. Here's another example. What we've built is a way to encode characters as sequences of ones and zeros. This is essentially the way all data is represented with computers. We ask a bunch of really personal questions about the data and store the answers as ones and zeros. Let's try and find a series of questions that would let us identify any natural number. These turn out to be a stepping stone to representing more complicated things. So finding a good set of questions will be well worth our time. Let's start off by only representing numbers between 0 and 15. A simple way to represent this would be to make one question for each number. We store each number by answering yes on the corresponding question and no to all the others. While this works, it's also comically inefficient. To store a number up to 1 billion, which computers do regularly, we would need a billion and one bits. This inefficiency comes from the fact that there are plenty of meaningless responses that we aren't using. Something we can do about this is to give meaning to all the unused combinations of responses. Let's say that if more than one response is yes, the number it represents is the sum of all the numbers we responded yes to. But this is now inefficient in a different way. There's now many different ways to represent a single number. If we wanted to represent 3, we could do it by adding 1 and 2, or we could use the dedicated 3-bit. In fact, it turns out that the dedicated 3-bit is entirely unnecessary. Any time we need to add 3 to our final number, we could just add 1 and 2 instead. Kicking out the 3-bit makes our representation slightly more efficient. 4 is now special because we can't represent it by combining other bits. This means we have to keep it around and can't kick it out. However, we can kick out 5, 6, and 7. 8 is again necessary to make this party work, but after that we can kick out all the remaining guests. We can also kick out 0 because adding 0 to our number changes nothing, and we can represent 0 by setting all the other bits to 0. We end up with the somewhat surprising fact that all it takes to represent numbers from 0 to 15 is 4 bits. If you're not convinced, you can pause and check that all these combinations work for each number from 0 to 15. I want you to notice a pattern with the numbers we've ended up with. Notice how each one is two times the number to its left. This is a direct consequence of the fact that there are only two possible states for each bit. If we flip the order around, we can contrast this with our more familiar decimal system of representing numbers. In this system, each digit has 10 possible states, making each place worth 10 times the one to its right. This is also where the convention of calling the bit states 0 and 1 comes from. This convention forms a numbering system with a 1's place, 2's place, 4's place, and so on. Just like in the decimal system, we can extend this numbering system to however many bits we want. The maximum value we can store with a certain number of bits or digits follows these formulas. Computers often work with 8, 16, 32, and 64-bit numbers. 
8-bit games are called 8-bit games because they ran on computers that could work with a maximum of 8 bits at once. If you get into cryptography, you may also see 128, 256, and 512-bit numbers. Researchers have also recently found 1024-bit numbers to be very useful when measuring the time since I last uploaded. Most commonly, you'll see 32-bit numbers, as these go up to 4 billion, which is sufficient for most needs. Now that we have a way of representing numbers, we can invoke the power of abstraction. What abstraction lets us do is stop talking about individual bits and start talking about numbers. Since we have a technique for converting between bits and numbers, any technique that can turn a piece of data into numbers is also a technique that can turn that piece of data into bits. This is the key power of abstraction. It lets us talk about higher level concepts without worrying about all the details. I say it's the most fundamental concept in computer science because every program you've ever used is built on a huge tower of abstractions, each layer building new things out of the pieces the previous layer provides. We're currently building our own tower of abstraction, which started at numbers and will eventually reach the soaring heights of video. Before we get to colors, let's use our ability to represent numbers to figure out a representation for text. We can store text by assigning each character its own number. We then store a sequence of characters as a sequence of their corresponding numbers. So 72, 69, 76, 76, 79 represents hello. Let's again use the power of abstraction, this time to describe colors. In nature, colors are incredibly complicated. There's an infinite number of primary colors, and they can be combined together in whatever way you want. However, here we can take advantage of a quirk of the human eye. We're really only capable of responding to three groups of colors, reddish ones, greenish ones, and bluish ones. Primary colors in nature trigger some combination of these sensors, causing you to perceive that particular color. But you can trick the eye into thinking it sees that same color by manually triggering that combination of sensors with red, green, and blue lights. We can represent the intensity of the red, green, and blue light needed to reproduce a particular color using three 8-bit numbers. The precision we get this way is sufficient for most applications. As a quick detour, something I didn't realize for the longest time is that this actually has limits. There are colors that your screen simply cannot replicate the experience of. For example, here's what a rainbow looks like as approximated by your computer screen. And here's what it looks like when we turn down the intensity of some of the colors so that their hue is accurately represented by your screen. Notice how turquoise some of the greens look now. Your monitor is literally incapable of reproducing this color at full laser-like intensity. You would need a specially colored light to reproduce it. Or you can go outside. Anyway, now that we have a way of representing colors, we can evoke the power of abstraction and instantly forget about how it works. On to pictures. Pictures are just grids of colors. The way we store them is by putting each grid cell, called a pixel, one after the other. Add in a couple numbers at the start, telling us how many pixels wide and tall the final image is supposed to be, and we're done. And finally, videos are just sequences of images, displayed rapidly one after the other. Since videos are just sequences of images, and images are sequences of colors, and colors are sequences of numbers, and numbers are sequences of bits, this means that videos are just very, very, very long sequences of bits. Specifically, this video weighs in at about 10 billion bits. However, it's worth noting that if you used the exact representation demonstrated in this video, it would weigh far more, about 10 trillion bits. What's happened is that we've skipped over some of the details. Like with our initial number example, we're storing a lot of redundant data. For example, if an object simply moves across the screen, our current technique stores many different copies of what that object looks like, just positioned at different points on the screen. What we could do about this is store what the moving object looks like only once, and then store a series of small commands telling the computer to move it around on the screen. These kinds of techniques are called compression algorithms and their goal is to represent data using as few bits as possible. These techniques do have limits. For example, they're famously bad at any video containing confetti, but it works well enough for most use cases. I'll probably do another video about how these work, so. One question this all raises is, how do we tell if this pattern of bits is a number, a color, or a guess who character? 
or an image or a video or a piece of text or an audio file or a 3D model or a MIDI roll or an application or a copy of a computer. The answer is you can't. Okay, more specifically, there's no way to tell just by looking at the bits. For example, this series of bits we've seen before could be a familiar face or it could also be the number 81. This means that a computer needs to keep track of what kind of data some series of bits embodies. One popular technique is file extensions. For example, the bits in script.txt should be interpreted as text, while thumbnail.png should be interpreted as an image. If you wanted, you could rename a .png file to a .txt file, causing the computer to reinterpret the same bits as text instead of an image. But this doesn't really explain our question. After all, how does the computer know to interpret the file name as a piece of text? This brings us to another popular way to do it. Have it baked into computer instructions. Somewhere in the computer, there's a set of instructions that defines how file names work, and it's written to assume that the file names are stored in a text format. For example, the instructions defining how to draw a file name onto the screen might contain instructions like, if the file name starts with the letter F, put the color black at these positions in the screen and put the color white at those positions on the screen, which ultimately translates to pushing bits around. If the bits start with 01000110, then put all zeros at certain positions in the screen bits and all ones at other positions in the screen bits. If you just wanted to cause trouble, you could now ask how does the computer know to interpret the instructions as instructions? In which case I'd say that baked into your computer is a set of instructions called firmware that your computer is physically wired to look for and follow as soon as it starts up. Those instructions tell the computer to follow other instructions, which do some setup, and then tell the computer to follow other instructions, which do some more setup, and tell the computer to follow yet more instructions, another tower of abstraction, eventually reaching the point where the computer is finally asked to follow the instructions to draw a file name onto the screen. Before getting into why we bother doing anything this way, let's do a speed round of how to represent some other kinds of data. Audio is just changes in air pressure. So store how much air pressure should happen at each point in time using a number. 3D models are collections of triangles. First, store a list of points by using three numbers for each point. Then, store a big list of numbers saying which points to connect to make each triangle. Computer instructions are kind of like text, where each instruction is given its own number. Additionally, more numbers can show up after an instruction that have special meaning depending on which instruction precedes them. And now, the question of why. Why bother with this complicated exercise in the first place? Computers use electricity, which has a property called voltage. If we think of electricity like water, then voltage is water pressure. A simple way to use voltage to represent numbers is that the voltage you have is the number you're representing. But then, if you want to represent the number 300 million, you need 300 million volts, which is not good for your health. So then we might say, let's just make 10 volts represent 300 million and have 10 be as high as it goes. Aside from confusing Spinal Tap, this now has the problem that very small numbers are very close to each other. This is a problem because of interference. Radio stations, microwaves, 5G towers, and Wi-Fi routers are all conspiring to nudge your voltages up and down. In short, if the difference between 3 millivolts and 4 millivolts is the difference between your rocket pointing up and pointing down, you're screwed. This ultimately is why we use bits. Instead of using all the vast range of voltages we could possibly use, we pick two. A common choice is picking zero volts to represent the zero state and five volts to represent the one state. We can now build our circuits such that each component can recognize signals that are close to zero or close to five and round them to the nearest pure state. While some things like cosmic rays still pack enough wallop to change the zero to a one, it works for the overwhelming majority of interference we experience here on Earth. It also makes circuits way easier to design. Making circuits that can handle three or four or five different voltage levels gets very complicated very quickly. So ultimately, because of both interference and simplicity of design, bits are the way to go for any computing device. Today, we've learned about how and why computers store information using only zeros and ones. We saw how to use abstraction to start with bits, work our way through numbers, colors, and images, finally ending up at videos, without having to come up with all the billions of questions that a video file answers. We saw how file extensions and computer instructions are used to ensure we interpret bits correctly. Finally, we saw how bits compensate for the problem of interference and make circuits simpler to design, forming the reason why we use them in the first place. 
Thanks for watching this sequence of ones and zeros. I hope you learned something interesting.